Hello and welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul, co-host Justin Baker, joining via Skype. Good evening, Mr. Baker. Yeah, good evening, Mark. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem. It was uh, It's my pleasure to always have you on the show. Uh, basically, don't do any shows without you now. So, Ayo. Hey, uh, so huge action in, in game number four. Uh, the St. Louis Blues come storming back. They got blown out in game three. Uh, basically, I should say that Ryan O'Reilly came storming back, and we find ourselves all tied up going back to Boston. It, it's a best of three, and I, I don't know about you, but it, it, it still feels like it's Boston series until today finding out that Chara might miss game five because of a broken jaw, which if he misses game five, you know, you, we don't know about game six and so on and so forth. And even so, how effective is a shattered jawed Chara in, in the final three games? And that will have a big impact, I think, on on this series. Uh, your take on uh, on Saturday nights or Monday nights game four. Yeah, I, I have to say, first off, Ryan O'Reilly, I mean, he came back, like you said, storming big. I mean, had a, I don't want to say a stinker of a game in game three, but he was just non-visible and just shows up at the right time for St. Louis. And, um, I mean, let's face it, St. Louis basically outplayed Boston in every area. They played their game. They they managed to get on the forecheck, throw the body around, and when they did that, they were cycling the puck, and they looked pretty freaking good doing it. And, uh you know, for lack of a better term, the better team won in this one. Yeah, the Boston Bruins, I think, were they were finally forced to play St. Louis's game. I think that was probably the biggest difference. Uh, I I still get the sense that Boston maybe has an easier time scoring goals. Uh, in that, you know, St. Louis gets the first goal, and suddenly, you know, Boston. Boston eventually comes storming back. They they score. They tie the game. Uh, every time Boston scored, it just felt like, uh, yep, of course they scored that way. Well, yeah, like just these these weird like St. Louis has the play. They've they've got control. They're moving the puck beautifully in in the Bruins zone, and then just a little a little rush down the other way, and a random little rebound squirts out, and there there we go. That's you know one of the goals that was scored. It's just it feels like Boston isn't struggling to score at all whereas st louis is grinding it out for every possible goal and that is maybe the one thing if if you're st louis that worries me can you for another three games potentially outwork the bruins four goals meanwhile the bruins there you know they're just going to pick up these what seem like lucky garbage kind of goals but it's just the way that i mean it's the way they play it's the way they played all playoffs is that they've they found a way to score even when they've been outplayed i mean that's kind of a, the sign of a a pretty good team too yeah and i will say you know for boston too you look at you know they they've been getting just solid goaltending back from tuka rask and i mean even in their losses he still has looked solid to me and if you're, if you're Boston and you're you're trying to think of positives going back home to Beantown, you you can look right right back at Tuca and say, hey, we got a goaltender who, you know, even in our two losses here, has still looked pretty dang good, and we can continue to play our game because we know we got a reliable goalie back there to to back us up. Yeah, I mean, goaltending certainly can't be discounted. Uh, I think at the beginning of the series, it was kind of like, well, I think this is probably a wash, uh, but. Bennington's play in Game Three uh, has really swung those those fences, or maybe towards Tuka Rask right now. Uh, but I mean, it can just as easily swing back. Uh, he had I mean, Bennington had a good Game Four, uh, but it's it. This is just a no momentum series, is what it feels like. You know, right. but that Game Two, it felt like oh, okay, the Blues are here. Oh, okay, the the Bruins destroy you in Game Three, so uh, it. It's it's gonna just come down to game seven, like I said. <laughs> That's yeah. uh, I'm sticking with my Blues in seven, and I mean a win in Boston for for the Blues. They've already proven they can do it once. Can they do it twice, three times, <laughs> perhaps? Uh, I I think it's it's certainly possible. I think though, 
Oh man, it's it's tough to say that the the Blues are going to win again Wednesday and again Friday, which would be your your Blues in six, I believe, is what you had. Yeah, but let I mean, let's be honest. We said the same thing. At least I did about their play against San Jose. I figured San Jose would yeah you know, down two one to San Jose as well, and yeah. they, they came back. So maybe just a uh, same exact thing. We'll we'll have to find out. Uh, I uh, so you're sticking with Blues in six. I you know what I'm, I'm I gotta stay hard fast on this one. You know I still believe the Blues have have all the momentum in terms of their their forward group, and I, I do think. You know, not having Char for Game Five is really going to hurt. Um, you know, Boston, especially when it comes to um, their defensive depth and penalty kill. I mean, Char is their guy back on the PK. Not having his presence to block shots to to manage the game is really going to. I mean, you're going to look at guys like McAvoy and Krug now and say, "Can you step up and play 30 minutes a night?" Because let's not forget, too, Grizzly still is not going to be able to play because he's under concussion protocol. Um, so, you know, we don't, I, we don't know when he'll ever return back, you know, for this series at all. And, uh, you know, whether we get a Chara back in game six is still yet to be determined. And I think really their depth on defense is really going to have to, it's going to, you're really going to see if they're, if they're up to the task here. Okay. Here's, here's one more for you. Is the winner of game five going to win the series? I, you know what? I would have to say yes. I mean, more times than not, it's usually, you know, especially when you're coming into a series tied two to two, you know, it's it's easier for the team that's up, you know, has to win one out of two of the last two games than it would be to, to go back and win two. And I think, you know, St. Louis right now, you know, they've got a lot to a lot to really hang their heads on in terms of momentum. And, uh, you know, I think Boston, you know, you lose your captain, you lose your leader on the ice. And granted, you know, he'll be there in the locker room, but it's still not the same thing. And I think, you know, when you even go back to the cup, you know, that Boston won against Vancouver, you, you look at, you know, guys like Bergeron and Chara, they were the leaders in there. And, and yeah, Char, or Bergeron's still there, but, you know, not having Chara on the ice, I think, is probably going to do a lot more damage than we think. I, I think he's going to play. I really do. do. Yeah. I, I mean, at this point, let's say I'm the coach of the, the Bruins. Let's say I'm Bruce Cassidy. What, what, it, what advantage do we have by saying that he is for sure going to play? You know, then, then okay, then uh, then St. Louis is preparing for him to be out there. But if we know uh, he, he's going to play, well, we'll just say we're not totally sure, though, because I guess there's the chance that he might not, but we're pretty sure he will. So you kind of put that little bit of doubt in, in the, the Blues' mind. I think there is something to say about it. You know, if you're maybe thinking, okay, cool, we're going to get a game without Chara, and then Frick, he's back, and he's just as good as he was before. He'll just have a giant cage on. Uh, I I do think there's a little bit of gamesmanship, and I think that that's what's happening here. I think he will play in Game Five. Of course, uh, you know this take could age horribly because it's only like 22 hours away from Game Time. So, uh, <laughs> so very quickly, I could I could be proven wrong. But that that's my that's my prediction. I think he will play. I, I don't think you pass up a Game Five in the Stanley Cup because you broke your jaw. Give me a, you'll be fine. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to get hit. It's going to hurt like a mother. And then you just deal with it or you don't play the rest of the game. But I, I, I still think, I think the Bruins with Chara playing maybe 15 to 18 minutes are still better than without him, especially to your point with Grizzly out. Yeah, I, I won't disagree with you there. But at the same time, I think on the blue side, for them, their game plan, they're, they're, they're sticking to it regardless of Chara's in there or not. I think they're, I don't think they'll alter their the way they want to play the game. I think, you know, if Char is out there, I actually do think, you know, you might see a Blues team attack him a little bit more than they, they typically would. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what kind of Char we get. And, um, you know, again, I, I agree with you, though. Boston, you know, it's just throw it all on the line right now. Game five, who cares anymore? Just just put him out there and, you know, see what you get. Because, again, he's he's better on the team on the ice with a broken jaw than he is off the ice. Is true. Uh, okay, well, we'll leave uh, we'll leave the Stanley Cup Finals alone for a little while. You know, we still much more to talk about uh, as we go to the rest of the league because there are twenty nine other teams about to be thirty other teams, and we have the NHL draft. It's coming up very soon. I, does, is it just me or does it feel like this year's particular Stanley Cup Final is going long? 
I guess it, it, it kind of does. I mean, I guess it usually yeah, I, goes into June, but I, it's this one just feels longer than than usual. I don't know. Yeah, I'm 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 with you on that one. I mean, you know, I'm I don't know if it's maybe the excitement, uh, my own excitement for just the draft coming up and the the amount of RFAs we have and you know the the big name free agents that are you know going to hit the market here, and it's like the excitement for that just building so long. It just feels like maybe the playoffs are dragged down a little bit because of it. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, that draft is Friday, June twenty first is when we get the first round, and then and then Saturday the twenty second for rounds two through seven. Uh, and so, what we want to do on the show for uh, for probably the next you know two and a half weeks and leading up to the draft, we want to try and get through all the teams, especially the lottery teams. Um, we're just going to run right through the first round order and talk about who potentially uh, these teams might take, what they might do with their picks, and I'll, I'll just do it an off-season kind of rundown, more so leading into the draft. Uh, I think we'll we'll leave most of the the free agent talk for uh, for post draft and leading into that. Uh, of course, it'll come up, but. Uh, I think we're going to focus mostly on well, like what can they do in the draft via trade. We've already seen one trade, actually, uh, where the Winnipeg Jets have traded Kevin Hayes to the Philadelphia Flyers, or his you know his rights, I guess, to the Flyers for a fifth-round pick. I expect we'll see a few more of those style trades where you know teams want to want the extra crack at signing a guy. Uh, obviously, the Flyers know what they want, and so they made that move, and uh, we'll we'll get to all that, but let's start out with the New Jersey Devils, who uh, they weren't the worst team in the league by any means, but they were the luckiest, grabbing the first overall pick, uh, having their choice now of Hughes and Kako. Uh, let's just go right there. First question, in your opinion, Devils, are they taking Jack Hughes at center, or are they going with the, the flashy winger who blew up the European leagues in Kako. Yeah, while I like Kako a little bit better right now, um, I, I ultimately think the Devils do pick Hughes. I, I think this is a better fit for Jack Hughes. I mean, this is a team that desperately needs another centerman. Uh, Nico Heischer is a fine center. He's a, you know, he's a quality second line potential, you know, decent first line center and somebody I would not be upset if he was my first line center. Um, yeah, he's like a Ryan but, Johansson, maybe maybe of that caliber, where you're like the 25th best first line center in the league, kind of thing. Right. Top. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Top. Uh, don't get me wrong. A lot of other teams would be more than happy to have him as their top center. So, um, but to have a Jack Hughes to put behind Heischer for a couple years, or maybe even just one year, and let this kid, you know, avoid some of the bigger defensive assignments and and get to really learn the game a little bit better. Um, I think that's just that would be just a perfect fit for them. And then moving forward, long term, future wise, to have those guys as your one and two center, no matter if you know Hughes eventually jumps Nico Heischer and the the order, the pecking order there, um, it, it's not a bad thing to have. And we we see it, you know, with every Stanley Cup winner these days. Now that you have to have depth at the center position, and to me, this is the most important position right now for the New Jersey Devils to be drafting for. Yes, and that is really the that's the crux of it. It's uh, he plays center, and I mean, Kako is going to be phenomenal. Uh, there's there's no no doubt about it. But so is Jack Hughes. Both of them are going to be great players, and so at that point, you have to go. Who is going to have a bigger impact on the ice? Uh, and it's likely going to be Hughes over the course of you know at least like the next ten years. You're probably looking at Hughes to be the guy in New Jersey, even more so than, than he sure. Uh, whereas Kako, you know, on, on the one hand, I suppose could Kako be like, you know, you know, like an Ovechkin where, I mean, he doesn't say play like Ovechkin, but, uh, where he's a winger, like a Patrick Kane or, or Ovechkin, a winger who drives the play. You know, there's, sure. there's few of those in the league. Very few. Uh, most of them need a center who can drive play and then they're able to, you know, to do it on their own. I'd say that Miko Rantanen is a guy that can drive play on his own. Uh, but look at how much better he is when he's next to Nathan McKinnon. Uh, I guess that would be the case for everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> say that uh, that 
you don't have to try as hard when you have a really good center. I think you look at Washington's struggles for a long time was like, who else can we get to, to, to come in here and play with Ovechkin and Backstrom or, or maybe Ovechkin shouldn't play with Backstrom and he should play with someone else. Who else can we get that can play with him? Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of those question marks. Uh, I mean, I guess that can always be the question mark, no matter what position you have, when you have a really good player, you got to find the right guys to be with them. But I, I do think Hughes, Hughes will go number one. The only way that he doesn't, I'll say this, the only way that he doesn't if, is if Taylor Hall says, I want to sign here, but I want to play with Kako. Wow. That, that would be it. Now, now there is something to be said about, let's look at the Boston Bruins, who are in the Stanley Cup Finals. They have a three-headed monster line, and it works very well for them. So imagine a, a Heischer, Hall, Kako line. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't hate that. And it's working for the St. Louis Blues, too. I mean, they granted, they do have depth you know, beyond the first line, but they have a three-headed monster with Schwartz, Tarasenko, and Shen right now that's working pretty good. So you can't fault that logic. Yeah, I mean, there's it, it definitely, def, absolutely works. So it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be a big toss-up uh, in the end as to who you know who they take. But I just think that Jack Hughes, you're going, you're going. They have to take him. Uh, the The Rangers are actually in the best position because <laughs> they just get yeah. to. They just, I mean, no one's going to fault them. It's almost like the Philadelphia Flyers, right? When the Devils took Heischer, nobody faulted the the Flyers, and I and I still don't think that they can for taking. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name now. Nolan Patrick. Nolan Patrick can't fault them for taking him because he was the de facto number one for so long, and then they didn't take him, so they had to take him. And I, yeah. I still think he'll probably pan out to be something pretty good. Uh, he's he's only what twenty years old, so he'll he'll be okay. Don't worry, uh, us, <laughs> uh, but it, it'll be real nice if they can bring in. You know, they they trade for Kevin Hayes. If they can sign Kevin Hayes, that's a that's a nice addition. Yes, uh, it is. The Devils outside of their first overall pick, obviously that is the the big one. But uh, are the Devils? Do you think looking to do anything else at this draft? Yeah, I, I mean, let's let's face it. They they need scoring. They need defense. Um, and to me, I think maybe what they might want to explore is trying to find some goaltending depth. Uh, you look at this organization, and uh, granted, they are stuck with Corey Snyder's contract for a couple more years. But you know, beyond him, and you could even look at Blackwood. There's not much in terms of depth, and you know, finding a guy to maybe you know take over for the future. I, I know. You know, they. it's funny, you, you still look. They've got Eddie Lack in the minors, who's a UFA this year, so he's probably gone. But, uh, you know, they've got a couple other guys that have, you know, played either in the ECHL, AHL, that just, to me, are, are not future starters. And, um, you know, for a team that has struggled to keep the puck out of the net, and, you know, Corey Snyder looks like he is on the decline very, very fast and very hard. Um, they don't really seem to have a stopgap or an answer. You know, Ken Black would be that guy. I, you know, he might be a forty, you know, one A one B type goaltender, but I I don't see him being a, you know, sixty seventy game played goaltender that can start for you long term. Yeah, I suppose it's hard to it's hard to tell when a guy. I mean, he's still on his ELC. He's twenty two years old. So goaltenders sometimes they they surprise you. I e Bennington, uh, but with Corey Schneider. In my mind, you're you're gonna you're gonna give them one more year, like this is it right here, and sure. and and the nice thing for them about Corey Schneider is that it's not just a matter of like oh he just is playing poorly he's gonna get hurt hundred percent he's gonna get hurt, and so it's gonna be his hip, and they're gonna put him on LTIR if he gets hurt again if he's struggling he'll find his way on LTIR I think that that's probably how they'll solve their problem like they're gonna convince him hey. This isn't what you want to be doing. Like you're, he's always hurt. Uh, he has been for the last like three seasons. So I, I think I think that LTIR is probably what will eventually happen. I don't think it happens this season, and it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, truly, the the Devils have thirty five million dollars in cap space, and they don't have to re sign a anybody of 
vast significance that they're going to have to just pay out the wazoo for. So they're totally fine. Going into next season, they have $54 million in cap space. Ooh. So, I mean, there, there's a, yeah, obviously they have to re-sign Taylor Hall and blah, blah, blah. But they're, they're in no, and, and Nico Heischer, they're in no jeopardy of not being able to afford their players right now. Well, of course, they haven't been very good. So that's usually a, the one benefit of that. But to me, I, I, the one thing I think that the Devils could look to do is to possibly, if, you know, if they could find a taker for maybe a Travis Zajac, but they, you know, if they know, all right, we're bringing in Jack Hughes. I mean, maybe they're they're comfortable with Zay Jack continuing to play behind Hughes and being a third line center, which is probably more where he should he should be. But I think you also you consider the fact that Zaka can play center. You know, maybe he's your third line guy, or or maybe you're you're hoping that uh, like a Kevin Rooney or Blake Coleman. You know, they do have other options at center, and would they, you know, would they look to shed that? Travis Zajac contract. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, he's one guy. I just he's been overrated for the last maybe five years. It's been oh yeah, he's he's good, he's good. We promise he'll be good, he'll be good. And he just never really, <laughs> never really got above that about a forty five point kind of guy. So uh, those are the, those problems to me. Plus, they really need to bring in someone on the back end. I mean, and no offense to Andy Green, but I just don't think he's cutting it long term. Uh so I would I would look to the Devils maybe maybe looking to make a move defensively. Uh maybe a guy like Jake Gardner. If the Leafs don't re-sign him, I think Jake Gardner would be a great fit in New Jersey. Yeah, I I won't disagree with you and I think you know Outside of Sammy Votten, and to me, this defense, there's not anybody in there that I look at and get excited about. You know, I know Severson's all right, and, um, you know, Will Butcher has Butcher's his moments, okay. but outside of those guys, I'm just like, eh, this this is, you know, just a defense that I'm just, I'm kind of meh on, to be quite honest. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this defense, you go, okay, I, I understand why they finished towards the bottom of the league. That's just, you, you get it. You know, I, I think adding... Adding one player is going to help, obviously, with with Hughes or Kako, whoever they end up going with. But nothing's going to change if this defense can't move the puck more efficiently. Uh, as well, nothing's going to change if they can't stop a puck. So, I mean, this team is, <laughs> yeah, they made the playoffs uh, just two seasons ago. Uh, but this team just doesn't look like, like that, that year, I think, was an anomaly it doesn't look like adding one player is going to allow this team to surpass. Like who? Who? You know who are they? Who are they going to have to be better than next year? Carolina? Do we see this team being better than Carolina? I don't think so. Uh, maybe like you know you look at this team and you look at Pittsburgh, who barely snuck into the playoffs. Pittsburgh is a significantly better team than this New Jersey Devils team, at least on paper. <laughs> what we're looking at, so. I you know I, I look at that and I go all right well that's what you have to be able to jump and even though Pittsburgh's problem may be defense as well they still have Chris Letang you know Justin Schultz is serviceable they they have some guys who can actually play whereas the Devils you know even even Andy Green is a serviceable guy how much for how much longer he's thirty six years old and you know it only takes it takes one weird season where a guy comes back and you go uh oh. <laughs> he looks different. What happened in the off season? And, <laughs> and they, they just don't look the same. Uh, I, I would expect Sammy Votnin. And uh, I think that another move that they'll do, but possibly uh, if Taylor Hall, which he has said, he's not interested in a, in an extension right now. I think something that would help is get a guy like Sammy Votnin and locked up who is a UFA at the end of the year. He's only making four eight five. I think that he's due for a raise, probably in the six million dollar range. Get him locked up long term. You know, do do the other work to show Taylor Hall that you're you're serious. You're going to bring in people to surround him with, and then I think he'll you know he'll be more willing to come to the table. Uh, but at this point, you know, I, I'd be looking at this roster and go, I mean, we're probably three or four years away from competing for a Stanley Cup. You know. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question: 
do you think if it's possible that this may be with the cap space they have the one of the one teams that could possibly make an offer sheet to one of these sexy RFAs out there? Yes, I suppose they they certainly could. Uh, yeah, like a Mitch Marner, could they make that Mitch Marner? See, I just I I'll say it right now, and I'll, I'll gladly eat my words. At uh, hold on, let me let me let me check here. At twenty five minutes and thirty two seconds of episode number 128 i will say <laughs> mitch marner is he he won't even sign a an offer sheet some team wow. comes to him i i think he'll just say no i'm i'm negotiating right now but he because he can easily go to the Leafs and go hey look i have an offer sheet i can sign it <laughs> and the Leafs could go well yeah you could sign that and you could go play for the new jersey devils uh, do you really think that that's going to get you to the Stanley Cup Finals right now? I don't. You know, I I think that there's something to be said about he's in a good spot right now. He's playing for a good team, and this team is just growing up together. And so he's in a very unique place, and he's at home. Like I, I just think there's too many things working in the favor of the Leafs for for that to actually happen. It's not to say that somebody won't give him an offer, but he also has to sign that offer. Oh, of course, and I—I I mean, maybe not necessarily a Mitch Marner, but um, you know, maybe a guy like a William Carlson or Brock Besser. Maybe they take a stab at a guy like that as an RFA. Yeah, but Vancouver's gonna. Vancouver's not gonna. They—they they have nothing stopping them from from signing those guys. I—I—I uh, I, I don't see that. The one, I guess, the one guy I could see, you know, maybe it's a like a Miko Rantanen, right? Isn't he? A, yeah, he's an yeah, RFA. He's an RFA. Uh, I probably myself I could see Carlson getting an offer sheet from somebody just because Vegas is so far up against the cap right now that they wouldn't be able to match it without that's, moving a bunch of pieces first. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. I think you get I think you get seven days to match. Yeah, that that is correct. But um, and again, you know, most people forget that you know you can go ten percent over the cap. So you know maybe that gives them the wiggle room because believe you me, I'm not giving William Carlson ten million dollars a year. Yeah, no. Yeah, they right now they have actually no cap space. <laughs> According to Cap Friendly, they have zero dollars in cap space. All right, beautiful. That's uh, that's impressive, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So that I guess that that would be a that would be a good signing. Although I just don't. When I look at William Carlson, like I think of all the other guys that you could offer sheet, and William Carlson's got to be towards the bottom. Like, what's he really going to do if he comes to uh, to New Jersey? He could be all right. Let's say he is, he's a second line center. I guess if you're going to do that, maybe you're like, well, we'll take Kako and we'll go and try and get a center. Hey, Cause, cause there Carlson you go. Could play center. I don't know. I yeah. I think it's I I think that the Devils though they're going to be looking to make some moves for a defender. Uh, I I know they're you know there's there's obviously the free agent options. Uh, there's also you know you look at the the Columbus Blue Jackets and what what they're going to have to do in terms of bringing other guys in. They may look to maybe trade one of these RFAs like a Ryan Murray perhaps. Uh, I, you know, it's not that I think that the Blue Jackets are going to have any problem signing their RFAs in terms of having this the cap space, but this is their opportunity to kind of figure out where they want this team to go long term. And if there's somebody on the defensive end that doesn't fit what they're looking for, you know, maybe that guy's on the chopping block. Maybe a guy like like a David Savard uh, could be moved, or I, I don't know. I, I think there's some some options for the for the Blue Jackets, and you know. Teams like trading uh, into a different conference. So there's that as well. The Nashville Predators have a lot of good defensemen. So, yeah. Well, let's not forget Winnipeg, too, with the Truba Meyer situation as well. Yeah, that's out there. That would be uh, that would be big. I, I think they've, they've got to be looking for a center for, for Truba. Oh, absolutely. How would you trade for Truba? How about uh, oh yeah? If you wanted a center, how about Nazem Kadri? Hmm. Obviously, you're not just gonna you're not just gonna get Nazem Kadri. You might go. What about Nas Nas and uh, Kapanen? 
No, I'd jump all over that if I was Winnipeg for sure. Yeah, I mean for true. I I I mean that's that's a hit. Like, you know, any I feel like any time you make a trade proposal and it's your team, you know, it needs to be a proposal that's painful, and that's how you know it's probably a good one <laughs> and something that's reasonable. <laughs> so okay, well let's let's uh, we'll move on to the New York Rangers. I feel like the New All York right. Rangers we, we didn't really talk about them a lot this last year. They it was just obvious that they weren't going to be good, and you know they were kind of a, a hard team to watch at times. Uh, where do you see this team going? Uh, here in this off season, obviously they're, they've we'll say they've got Kako, but beyond that, what what are they going to try and do here? Wow, this is a team that I think is really going to make a splash in the free agent market. I think they're going to try to move out some big name players, maybe like you know a Kevin Shat and Kirk, guys who can still get you something in return without being completely lost. Um, you know, wouldn't be a surprise too if they try to make a deal where Brennan Smith goes, you know, back somewhere else too. Uh, maybe to like an Ottawa where, you know, they might try to be, you know, might try to reach the cap floor by, by a move like this. And, you know, we've, we've heard Eric Carlson thing floated around with the Rangers as well as our Temi Panarins. Uh, you know, I, I do think the Rangers have some money to spend and I think they're really going to try to do it because you look at this team and, uh, you know, granted they only have, I think roughly a little under $20 million in cap space, uh, but they really don't have any big name free agents or restricted free agents that are going to cost them a ton of money. So to me, if they can move out a contract or two and try to get the services of a couple big name uh, guys off the UFA market, I think this team could really be right back in the thick of things, things in terms of contention for a playoff spot. Yeah. The question is, can they find somebody who's willing to take Mark Stahl off their hands? <laughs> somebody that, that somebody dumb enough. Yeah, that's the question, <laughs> the million-dollar question. <laughs> yeah, the the other thing with the Rangers, see, I, I think they probably still have one more year left of, uh, we'll say, pain, as it were. Uh, I just I don't really think this team has that that center that can really drive the play. Uh, I mean, Zabenejad's a nice, a nice piece. Elias Anderson could come in next year and, and maybe be – Top center, unless, you know, if magically Jack Hughes were to follow them, uh, may, obviously my opinion changes a little bit. I just think there's too many pieces on this team that still need to go. And we're going to figure out who, you know, is Chris Kreider? Do they extend Chris Kreider or is he a guy that is going to be uh, be shipped out? Because you're talking quite a few UFAs uh, into at the end of the next year. Chris Kreider, Nemesnikov, Jimmy VC, Matt Bolesky, who, God bless him, he got the best contract ever. Uh, <laughs> Jesper Fast. Uh, you know, you also on the on the defensive side, there's you know a couple guys who come up in a couple years. Brendan Smith, Mark Stahl, and Kevin Shat and Kirk, Kirk all have two years left on their deal, as well as Henrik Lundqvist. So, I mean, this team can look very different in two years. So you're going to have to decide who are we going to keep around? Who do you sell off for parts? And those guys would probably be pretty valuable type of guys to be able to go, hey, you know, you get Chris Kreider all year long. We want your first round pick. And, you know, or and do you just say we're, we're going for another year where we have a shot at a lottery pick? Because you're not winning this year, you know, even if you add one or two nice pieces. I, I just think it's, you you told your fans you're gonna you're gonna rebuild, like do this right. Don't don't rebuild for one year. Get one good player and then go. Okay, we're good. We're done. Like just stay the course. Let these other guys go. Let some of these guys walk and move the guys that you can. Lock up the guys that you think will be here in four or five years or who are you know who you consider to be necessary components to building the culture with your new younger players. I could see Kreider being a part of that. Uh, I think Nemesnikov's probably gone, but uh, I, I just think there's, there's quite a few changes that still can happen here for the New, new York Rangers. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you, but to, to the point, I, I think this team is, you know, is desperately searching for a top line center and, you know, obviously they're not going to get it. I, unless they get extremely lucky through the draft this year, um, 
you know, because cause most likely, I mean, let's face it, they're they're taking Kako here. Um, so if you're looking at the UFA market, maybe you you turn to a guy like Matt Duchesne, who had a pretty dang good postseason and not such a bad regular season, and you say, hey, you know, do you want to come hang out with Kako here for another seven years? And do you want to you come know, miss I, the playoffs I, again? <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, to your point, too, you know, one guy is not going to change the face of this franchise. And I think even if you do bring in a guy like Matt Duchesne, you say to him, hey, you know, this year we're we're probably not going to make the playoffs. Uh, We're going to try to dump some some players off, but we want you around long term to play along Kako here and help us rebuild this thing. And I think that that would be probably a, a kind of an attractive piece to me if I'm if I'm a guy like Matt Duchesne to get to play along a talent like that for another seven years. Okay. Uh, let's go scooting over to the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, we're not used to seeing them uh, picking third overall, but here we are. Uh, obviously, the uh, the Blackhawks are kind of on a what I would consider what I what I think will happen. I, I don't necessarily think they'll be back in the Stanley Cup Finals quickly, but the Bruins had kind of a downturn. You know, they missed the playoffs, and and, remember the, and people were were low on them, and it looked like there was going to be you know, a few years where they, they needed to totally retool. I think that's where the Blackhawks are. I think that Patrick Kane obviously still has tons to offer. Uh, they still have some some really nice pieces that they've been able to bring in over time. And now they get to add a pretty good player here, third overall. The issue is there's really no set third overall guy. You know, there there's uh, an Alex Turcotte. There's Dylan Cozens. Uh, a Kirby Doc. There's there's a few centers there that they could take with their third overall pick, but then there's like a Bowen Byram at, at third, who's who is just the probably the best defenseman in this draft, uh, hands down. I mean, he's definitely he scored 26 goals. Uh, he's a he is a goal scoring defenseman and can move the puck. So to me, that's if you're going to go defense, you're going with Byram, or do you lean towards we need a center? You know, Alex Turcotte's like a Chicago guy, so uh, maybe they go get the hometown guy. But any uh, any thoughts on who they might actually take? Yeah, it's it's pretty much a coin flip, in my opinion, between Turcotte and uh, Byram in defense. And I think, you know, if you look at it, it's not so much that, you know, Turcotte is a Chicago guy. Yes, that, that does play into it a little bit because – uh, let's face it, I don't think the Blackhawks are having trouble putting butts in the stands, regardless of how good or bad their team is. Um, I just think, honestly, this kid to me is the most complete centerman in the game in terms of two-way play right now. Um, I love what he does with his 200-foot game. and No knock on Jack Hughes, but obviously Turcock doesn't have the offensive upsides that a Hughes does. And, you know, Hughes will learn that. 200 foot game as you know as he grows in the NHL but I think right now Turcock to me is the most complete player so you have to look at it and say hey do we want to go get a second line center a uh, guy that could probably plug in and play right now potentially um, do we trust Dylan Strom or Anisimov to to continue to carry that load or do we want to go out and replace some of our aging defensemen because you know Brett Seabrook slowing down uh, Duncan Keith while he's, Brent Seabrook's he's, been slowing down for four years <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you there. But, uh, you know, Duncan Keith is, you know, he's opening the door to his exit. You know, he's slowly walking out. But um, so for the next few years, you know, you're going to get, a, you know, a less than stellar Duncan Keith. And so do you replace them uh, with a superstar defenseman who I think can potentially be uh, a number one on someone's back end? Yeah, to me, Chicago Blackhawks are going to go defense. It, you know, you look at their their defense right now. You look at what they have coming, and it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to not go the defense right now. They do have Adam Boquist, who they took in the previous draft, who who looks looks like he'll be real good. Uh, a, a, or he's a, a right handed D. Uh, then you know you get on the other side. You're uh, you're looking at Bowen Byram, and you know he can fill the other side. And I, I just think, you know, if you're Chicago, you got to go, we, we have forwards that can play like Dylan, Str- adding Dylan Strom last year and the way that he played in Chicago, I think probably eased a lot of nerves 
being able to go, okay, I think Dylan Strom can be a, a player in this league. I, I think that he can be a good second or third line centerman for sure. And we'll see if he doesn't develop beyond that. But I think with the rest of the depth that you have up front at the center position, I think you could maybe find a guy in free agency where you could fill in a, you know, a centerman on a second line or a third line kind of guy and just do things by committee. Whereas defense in free agency, you're not getting a, a number one defenseman in free agency. It doesn't happen. It is about to happen with Eric Carlson, but ignore that. <laughs> I heard that he's interested in going back to Ottawa. Uh, I don't buy that. I, I heard Ottawa Came out and Montreal's today. name floated around now. Uh, all these rumors have started mostly because his, his wife's a little homesick and he wants to be a little bit closer, which is why I think now the more and more I keep hearing about it, I'm thinking, okay, San Jose is almost like sitting at out. a 10% chance he'll re-sign. I think he probably wants to be in the East. You know, you look at Tampa, um, you know, they've got the, the home, the family connection with his wife there. Um, so yeah, being a little bit close to the East, I think would be ideal for the family situation. And I think that's why he probably will end up leaving San Jose. I just think, what if he goes back to Ottawa and we just go, holy crap, did he just like orchestrate this whole thing so that he could have a shot at a cup and load up Ottawa and then go right back to Ottawa and they're better than when he, than he, they would have been if he had stayed. Ah, I, I don't. I can't buy that. I just management there is just way too flimsy and up in the air. And I think, you know, he already passed up on an eight-year deal at eighty-eight million. And he's no, unless he gets a desperate enough team to sign him, I don't think he'll get anywhere near that type of money. Yeah, he's got to be kicking himself for not a little that. bit. <laughs> okay, let's go to the number four pick, which is. Well, it's Colorado, but we're going to actually go to Ottawa. This is, this is really a perfect transition. Uh, we'll talk Ottawa. They they do actually have the nineteenth overall pick with the with the Blue Jackets. So still with a first round pick. Um, I'm not going to try and tell you who they should take it at nineteen. I'll, I'll tell you who. Uh, there's uh, in a couple mock drafts. TSN has Connor McMichael. He's a center out of London in the OHL, and then. Uh, NHL.com and their mock draft has Ottawa taking uh, Soderstrom, who's a right shot defenseman, Suzuki, one of the smartest players in the Ontario Hockey League, and then uh, Thomas Harley out of Mississauga, a defenseman. So, you know, just kind of, at that point, it's it's so hard to tell at 19. You know, guys are just kind of picking <laughs> guys that are available. To me, I think that Ottawa goes forward if they can. I think that they have they have some pretty nice defensemen coming through right now. Uh, they'll just go best best player available, though. I guess that's usually what you're what you're going to do. But I, you know, I think of a guy like Ryan Suzuki. Uh, they already traded Nick, the older one, uh, way back. But I think that you know it would be good for Ottawa to bring in a guy who's just a playmaker. You know, you've got your Brady Kachuk. You've got some nice pieces up front, but bring in a guy who can, I mean, he had 50 assists in 65 games in, in Barry. And so I think he might be a good pick if he's available there. Uh, what is there anything else that this Ottawa team does in the, in terms of in the off season and, and at the draft? I mean, they may be one of the busier teams, right? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, uh, you know, to me, this Ottawa team, you know, we talk about salary caps and, you know, all these other teams having large cap room to spend some money. But to me, I think just the opposite for, for Ottawa. I think, you know, you look at their owner, Eugene Melnick, and they're going to be a team to me that is at the bottom in terms of cap it. And this could be a team that gets a lot of draft picks back by trying to take some bad contracts over and really, you know, one, to get them to the cap floor, but then two, you know, to relieve these other teams, but then yet to build for the future by, you know, obtaining draft picks and some prospects that they'll take along with those bad contracts. This is what's incredible about their defense. They actually have five players signed on their defense right now. All players that were on their, in their lineup at the end of the year. Uh, Cody CC, the one who is not signed at the moment, they have $4.4 million devoted to their whole entire defense core. <laughs> 4.4 million. That's ridiculous. To four to five players. 
<laughs> four of the five players are making nine hundred thousand or less. <sighs> the the most expensive defenseman on the Ottawa Senators is Mark Borowicki with a one point two million dollar cap hit. Stop it. <laughs> so I you know, maybe maybe I take back what I said about the, the Ottawa's defense. I guess they well, okay, they do have Eric Brandstrom. That's right. Eric Brandstrom came over in the Mark Stone deal. So he'll be up he'll be joining them up on their pro roster. He was there at the end of the year too. So there's your six. You don't even need Cody CC. <laughs> uh, I do think that you may see Mike Condon moved out. Uh, he is, he's got one year left on his deal at 2.4 million and he is a pretty serviceable backup. At least he has been in the past. Uh, they right now actually have 9.75 million devoted to three goaltenders. Honors huh? Nilsson, Craig Craig Anderson, and Mike Condon. So I think you could see the move, a goaltender to a team looking for maybe that B option, or or just a backup to play twenty games. Uh, I did see I saw a chart that was showing, you know, here's here's the goaltenders from the last ten Stanley Cup Finals and how many games they averaged in the season, and it was like all of them but one averaged less than sixty games, or had played less than sixty games or something like that. Uh, it was a pretty significant number, uh, a, like a low number for making it in. So basically all that to say, if you want to make it to the Stanley Cup Finals, you should probably not play your goalie 70 games. So you need a good backup. Um, any chance that they can unload Bobby Ryan? Any Anything that they could do there? Uh, I'm going to say no, <laughs> to be quite honest. Yeah, he actually uh, maybe helps them stay at the stay at the floor, so... Yes. Maybe they just keep him around. Uh, they do have a few UFAs at the end of the year that could be bait at the draft. Michael Bodker, he came over in the Eric Carlson deal from San Jose. Uh, John Gabriel Pajot, he is at three point one million UFA at the end of the year. A pretty nice third line center. If you could bring him in, good leadership as well. Uh, and then you know Mark Borowicki and Dylan Demello. I think they want to keep Demello around, but and, and Borowicki, I know. We all know from that video with the owner that obviously ownership likes him, so I'm sure he'll get a, a new deal. Uh, but when you really, when you look at this team, though, you go, okay, this is a team that is probably going to look completely different in two years. Uh, I, is there any chance that Marion Gabrick comes back and plays more for the Senators, or is he just like LTIR forever? Yeah, he's the new Joffrey Lupel at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and Clark MacArthur, he's definitely not coming back either so yeah ottawa's got maybe quite a bit of work to do it'll be interesting to see how much they're able to do and how much again like you said their owner is willing to spend uh one more team los angeles kings and we'll uh go to bed not together right. we're not going to bed together don't get any ideas this just got weird <laughs> uh <laughs> los angeles kings picking fifth overall they made the playoffs last year and then uh, really kind of just fell flat on their face. They were actually last place for quite a bit of time, and they or one of the last place teams, and they, they managed to kind of pull themselves up from that spot. Uh, but they, they get the fifth overall pick, and this team really could go anywhere, right? Like, do we see them going for, like, just speed? That's, that's what I see is just how, <laughs> how fast can this team get? Yeah, I I mean, let's let's face it. We we talked about it last off season, right? LA needed to get faster and what are they go and do? Sign Ilya Kovalchuk. So they definitely didn't get faster. He he was uh, he was he he he's actually has never been fast ever. That's true. Uh, he was he's never fast. <laughs> well, the big question is too is, you know, are they going to be able to move a couple of these contracts out that you know, I you look at Ilya Kovalchuk's contract, right? That's that's one that I think you know, is going to be a little difficult to move. They might have to eat a couple bucks, but he, you know, fell into bad favor. And now maybe, you know, with Todd McQuellen coming over, uh, you know, maybe he gets a second chance to, to play a few more minutes on this team and, uh, you know, make a make a run at being a decent player for his last couple of years here. Who knows? You know, So you don't think that Kovachuk's going to play for the Kings next year? I, I, I keep hearing his name thrown around in trade rumors, and I, I do think while he probably will start the season with them, I think if he... Um, if this team is down in the dumps and he is, you know, producing at a fairly reasonable rate, I, I think that maybe they could offload him somewhere. Um, to me, the bigger question, though, I think really is 
Um, you know, one name that comes to mind is Dion Phaneuf, whose contract could be moved. Um, I think there are some teams that could use a top four defenseman. And while I, I do think he had his moments last year, I, I think, you know, a fresh start for him would be good. And I think this would be a contract that maybe L.A. at this point would like to just get off the books. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that Nicole Volchuk, maybe, maybe New York Islanders willing to trade for him. Lou Lamorello. You know, go get his boy back. <laughs> and I'm sure Ilya Kovalchuk wouldn't mind living in that area either. You know, that's likely a, a spot he he would be willing to, like, he has a seven-team trade list that he can submit. But I think that that's probably a team he'd be willing to go to. Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I think when it comes to some of these guys that are, you know, like a Tyler Toffoli is a pretty interesting piece because... He had a he had a really down year this last year. Uh, he can play both sides, left and right. Twenty seven years old. He's making four point seven million for one more year. Uh, obviously, you'd like to see him produce like he did four years ago when he had thirty one goals and fifty eight points. But I mean, it, it, even the year the year last year, he had twenty four goals. And so, you know, you're you're hoping that he can. He scored twenty three, thirty one, and twenty four. But then he's also scored sixteen and thirteen. So which guy are you going to get? You know, I mean, it's seeming if you go by the pattern, he'll score 30, 20 to 30 goals this year, this next year. Uh, but Tyler Toffoli is probably a player the Kings would like to keep. It's a matter of, will he sign there? Will he sign an extension? And if he won't, I think that he'd be a player that a lot of teams would like to have. I mean, he's, he's got, you know, pretty good, uh, pretty good size, six foot, 200 pounds, you know, he can he creates space for himself. I I think that he's probably maybe the one guy that they could use to to move and use they they would have good leverage with him. He doesn't he doesn't have a no move unlike Kovalchuk and Dustin Brown and Fanuf who all have some form of, of a no move. Tyler Toffoli could be dealt. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with you, and I I do think a couple other names too to keep an eye on that could net the Kings a pretty decent return. Uh, Alec Martinez and Jack Campbell, because, uh, you know, you've, you've mentioned it before, you know, finding a good 1B goaltender um, is really key to having a good Stanley Cup run. And I think Jack Campbell has proven, you know, on such a terrible Kings team last year that he can put up some pretty fantastic numbers. Um, you know, so do the LA Kings look to move him because he's going to be a UFA next season? Um, you know, or... You know, a guy like Alec Martinez, again, one more year at $4 million, and for a top-four defenseman, that's a pretty good good number to have if you're looking to uh, to add on the blue line. Yeah, I agree. And there, you know, there's, uh, as, as far as this draft goes, it's definitely possible that a, a Bowen Bry- Byram falls to the Kings, and I think that they would scoop him up immediately. Uh, I also think they would probably love a, uh, like a Cole Caulfield who, he might be the best goal scorer in the draft, but he's small, uh, but he's pretty fast. And that, that to me is just, that, that's what they have to do. They have to look for a guy who uh, is probably just looks and feels a lot different than what they have right now. They have a lot of big, like, I mean, it's not that Kov- uh, Kopitar can't skate though, but they've got a lot of big guys who just, they, they play a little bit more in the corners a little better. They need somebody who they can kind of bring in and it, not only is he fast, but he, he looks fast. He has a different feel. He's not, okay, he's a big guy, so we can use him for his body. No, it needs to be somebody who's who's got that size that's a little smaller, and that's why he's also faster. And I think that you need to start changing the way that you think of these guys. And he's five foot seven. <laughs> that's a small boy, uh, but that's uh, probably the direction that they need to go. I mean, I don't know if you can bring in a – like. You're going to say you want to get faster and then you're going to go out and bring in like a, a Kirby Doc who's 6'4", 200 pounds. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. You've already got that guy. Yeah, yeah, I won't disagree with you. And I mean, I mean, hell, they, you know, Cofield, Col- you, you hear him constantly compared to the smaller guys in the league like Goudreau and Debrinket. And to be quite honest, that's not, that's not a bad couple names to be compared to. And yeah, especially if you're looking to, you know, add some speed and goal scoring there. There you go. Very true. Okay, well, that, uh, that'll that be our, our show here for the first five teams. Uh, our next show will go 
Detroit Red Wings, Buffalo Sabres, Edmonton Oilers, Anaheim Ducks, and the Vancouver Canucks. So we'll uh, we'll have some have some fun with your Detroit Red Wings. Definitely want to hear oh who you think they're gonna they're gonna take Steve Eiserman's first draft pick as Detroit Red Wings general manager. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at OT Hockey Talk, and uh, we will talk to you guys very soon. Enjoy game numero five. Tweet at us during the game. We'll be on Twitter. And uh, Justin, any final thoughts? Um, no, just hope the Blues keep doing what they're doing because I'm all about Team Pam right now. If you if you haven't heard the the rivalry between uh, Jim and Pam from the office, they have their their favorite teams right now. So um, I'm Team Pam. Ah, uh, yes, Team Pam. I uh, never got into the office. So ah, oh, that's tragic. So. Uh, yeah, I'm Team Don Dra- Don Draper. We'll say that. <laughs> All right, I, I do like that. I do like that. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. We'll talk to you soon.